much. So, um, yeah, I'd like to start uh, my presentation um, on the field research that I did in the, in the months of uh, February and March 2010. And uh, the topic was phenomenal growth of these uh, foreign telecommunication investment in insurgent Northeast India. Um, basically, uh, it's important for us to first uh, understand the problems that uh, uh, the Northeast India is facing. Because if you have a basic understanding of what's going on there, um, you'd able to get, maybe we'd be able to appreciate uh, any kind of study that's made there. So, um, uh, so I'll first try to begin with uh, the introduction to the, the part of the region. So, first of all, I'd like to show you the map of India. And the northeast India would uh, be around this area, the area where you can see, uh, yeah, over there, Bhutan and Bangladesh, right, right here, uh, next to Burma. So this area, which is like very uh, right on the extremity of India, is, is called northeast India. And it comprises of these following uh, eight states. And uh, Assam is the one which is in the middle, is, and it's also the economic center of the region. Uh, and it also has uh, nearly around uh, 3,000 kilometers of borders, international borders with China, Tibet, um, uh, Burma, Bangladesh, and uh, Bhutan and Nepal. So talking about uh, the introduction, um, I'd like to first tell you uh, the, the ethnicity of the people there and, and what makes it so different from the, from the rest of the nation. Uh, the seven northeastern states include the seven sister states and uh, Sikkim as well as Darjeeling. And uh, ethnically, it's distinct from the rest of the rest of India. In, and uh, linguistically, the region is distinguished by a preponderance of uh, Tibeto-Burman languages rather than the Indo-Asiatic uh, languages. And uh, the ethnic races there are primarily uh, paleo mongoloid as you'll see later. And uh, the chicken snake is a corridor of uh, which connects uh, India with uh, the northeast. It's just a 21 kilometer width of a small border which connects uh, the the mainland to the to the northeast region. So if you look, if you go back to the slide here, you can see that this is the the region that I'm talking about here, the borders between Nepal and and Bangladesh. So this is the little corridor of uh, 21 kilometers. Uh, which connects this region with the rest of the country. So, uh, and there is just one rail line. So if you cut the rail line there, maybe the whole region is cut off from the rest of the country. So it's a very delicate, delicate region. Because of this, there has been um, a lot of insurgency as well in this, this area, trying revolutionary and uh, pre-independence uh, movements. So uh, basically, these are Assam, Nagaland, Mizoram, and uh, Meghalaya, Manipur, and Tripura princely, and these were originally princely states which were annexed uh, into the British Empire, uh, including Burma, at the beginning of the 20th century. That's, uh, that's, historic, that's the history. And uh, predominantly, the, the, the forest and the, the, there are uh, sub -humid, uh, subtropical humid climates, which extends from uh, Himalayan, Himalayan uh, borders right until Indochina, Vietnam. So it's the same kind of uh, subtropical climate, and it's the same kind of people. And uh, according to Bhavan, in, uh, in 1962, he identified the Mongoloids of Northeast India to be Paleo-Mongoloid in nature, and they are the dominant tribes living in Assam, uh, frontiers, uh, Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, etc. And uh, if you look at the pictures, here I have the pictures of the, of the tribes uh, there. On your left, you can see the tribes. Um, of Nagaland and Manipur. And on your left, you see again the 100 rhinoceros, which is, um, which is a protected species in Assam. And also you see the Naga headhunters, the, the, the headhunters who uh, were in the region before the British, rule, uh, the British um, came and conquered them. So this was until uh, the late 20th century. So after we have uh, seen the history, uh, the, the anthropology, the history, the ethnicity of the people, the languages, uh, we see how it's distinct from the rest of the nation. So because of this, there has been a lot of uh, insurgent problems, problem, people trying to, uh, a lot of growth strength for independence. And 
this uh, fighting has been going on for may maybe around 60 or 65 years now. It's a long time this, the conflicts have been going on. So why uh, they are fighting? Because they feel they're different and because the connection is just a uh, chicken snake, a 21 uh, kilometer border. And the other reason could be that because we have a neighboring country, Burma, Myanmar, which is uh, in, in a high degree of conflict. So you can see here that on the map I've shown that the Kachin state, the Shan state on the east, the Qin state, these states have been fighting for uh, independence for, a, for m more than like 100 years from Burma. So this conflict puts a lot of, uh, a lot of impact on northeast of India. Because you see that we are sharing here, like as I said, we are sh sharing nearly uh, 2,000 kilometers of borders with Burma. A lot of uh, guns and a lot of conflicts is getting infiltrated into our region and um, in, in northeast India, in my, in my state, people are uh, getting trained and they are having free access to arms. This leads to the conflict in both the regions, northeast India as well as the eastern sector, uh, the western border of Burma. So on the right here on the slide, I have mentioned the name of the ethnic uh, factions which are fighting for independence against uh, the uh, Burmese Janta. So you can see around six of them are the major ones. And the uh, Karen and Kachin Independence uh, Army is number one and number five. Uh, they have been recently uh, really infiltrating and they have been like inflicting a lot of havoc on the uh, Burmese uh, Janta. So in uh, compared to that, let's look at, okay, now you look at the next slide, it talks about major militant groups in Northeast India. So when you talk about these seven uh, colored states on your left, you see that the number of insurgent groups are nearly double of what you saw in the last slide. In here, uh, in Assam, the United Liberation Front of Assam, it's, it's one of the major ones. In Nagaland, NSC and IM, the National Socialist Council of Nagaland. And uh, in Manipur, Pripak, uh, People's Revolutionary Party of the Kangali Park. So these are the ones who are the major players. And they, uh, at the moment, for, for the last 10 years, there has been a little ceasefire. But before that, maybe 50 years, they had been in conflict. So this, this region is uh, seeing a lot of conflict. So until now, I have explained to you how I've explained to you uh, why they are fighting. I explained to you the effects of the um, uh, insurgency. Now let's look at the other factor. OK, so actually, uh, the next slide talk, talks about the curse of natural resources, because um, According to Tobias Kronberg, he said that economies that are richly endowed with natural resources, they tend to grow slowly. And uh, according to Michael L. Ross, he talks about a uh, very important point here. He says, oil increases the likelihood of conflict, particularly the ones which are of the separatist, separatist type. So uh, Assam and the Northeast region is, is, um, is, uh, it has a lot of oil in it. So oil, it, it has a likelihood of creating conflict, especially the ones which are separated. For example, uh, East Timor, and we've also seen that uh, Brunei was able to separate because they had oil. So oil creates this kind of uh, problems. And uh, lootable commodities like gemstones and drugs, they do not make the conflict. Uh, they try to lengthen the, the existing conflicts. So we, uh, my, the Northeast region is also uh, full of uh, gemstones and oil. So this uh, are the reasons why separatist groups are able to pay for their expenses, pay for the guns, and uh, this this uh, lengthens the process of conflict. And uh, and according to uh, Martha Crenshaw in, in her book Comparative Politics, she also talks about uh, perhaps terrorism is most likely to occur precisely where massive passivity and the Eli dissatisfaction coincide. So the Elites are in this region have been really dissatisfied with. Uh, what the government is taking care of them, the central government sitting in uh, Delhi. So this creates a lot of uh, dissatisfaction and uh, tries to um, help the movements. In this, uh, uh, in this, in this study, I have uh, done, a, done the, these are the three books that I consider for my literature review. Uh, Sanjay Hazarika on the left, uh, Strangers of the Mist, Beyond Counter Insurgency, a book written by Sanjay Bora. And the last book is uh, written by Sumita Ghosh. So, in this book, uh, particularly the book on the on your right, uh, Sanjay Assam, is particularly relevant in, in this case because the person the 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 person was a researcher who had been uh, abducted by the United Liberation Front of Assam and he was he was um, assassinated. So then this book uh, and his wife wrote this book. So it it shows you that even um, like how the researcher did his research and uh, what problems he faced while he was kidnapped and etc. So this is the literature review that I did. And 
Uh, these are the questions which I was trying to answer recently in, in the past three or four years. There has been this investments from foreign telecommunication companies uh, coming to the Northeast region, but they know that it's like it, it's in conflict, but still they came and they made good profits. So what are the reasons and what kind of problems did they face and what are the factors of this um, high insurgency in, uh, impeding their uh, smooth running? Like what are the reasons and uh, did the government help or support the networks? If yes, then what until what extent? So these are the kind of things that I'm trying to look into. And uh, these are the uh, foreign investors which I chose. So on your, yeah, you can see uh, on your left, you can see that uh, Telenor is a Norwegian company, um, and it collaborated with Unitech of India, uh, from based in Delhi, and then they they formed a joint uh, venture called Uninor. And on your right, you see Maxis from Malaysia, uh, invested uh, together with Dishnet of India, and they formed Aircel. By the way, Aircel is the number one. Uh,